This is Six Tackles with Gus, with Matthew Thompson and Gus Gould. Gus Gould. Well, welcome to the podcast for this week, round 19 of the NRL Origin out of the way, and we are on the run to the finals. Some great games to come uh, this weekend. We'll have a look at those. We'll have a look at the coaching merry-go-round. We're going to go with a bit of old school chat. I've seen some interesting stuff this week uh, that I think Gus will enjoy and uh, will have an opinion of. Well, I've had a few days off, Gus, after Origin. I feel fresh and I feel ready to rock this weekend. Are you feeling fresh? Uh, very busy at the moment. Uh, Matthew, very busy. Off. Early starts, late finishes, seven days a week, but that's what the rugby league season is. Mm. Before we What's start... What's old-fashioned talk? Well... Just because it's me, it's old-fashioned. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, pretty much. No, I've seen some seen some classic old shots that have some particular um, elements of them that I want to talk about, like okay. you know, old numbering and you know, okay. various other things. No grass on the fields or... All that sort of stuff. Scrums where they used to push. <laughs> yeah. I saw, saw some, a couple of great shots of you that I'll, I'll bring up. Um, that's coming up. That'll be, be a bit of fun. But before we get on to footy, I know you talked about this. Uh, he was your salute on Monday. An Australian has won the British Open in, uh, gee, it was four great days of golf at the old course of St Andrews. And Cameron Smith from Queensland uh, wins the Claret Jug in spectacular fashion. Smith has won the 150th Open. He is the champion golfer of the year. Oh, and what a champion golfer he is. Up to world number two now. But uh, that was one of the great closing rounds in major history, I've got to say. The shot on the shot on 17 where he had the, the road hole bunker in front of him and putted around it and then made the putt to maintain a one-shot lead going into the last hole was, would have to be up there with some of the great Tiger Woods... Miracle shots. And if not, he didn't hold it like Tiger did, but to hold his nerve and then hold the putt. Like, how good was it? Yeah, he was brilliant. Um, wonderful last round. If they say that major tournaments start on the back nine on Sunday, he shot 30 on the back nine. Yeah. He held his nerve when all about those were all about him were losing theirs, and he got the job done. As you say, his putting was extraordinary over the whole four days. Third day, it went a little bit cold on him. Um, but you always have one average round during the course of the uh, of the four days. He didn't play himself out of contention. He kept himself in contention and then a, a brilliant last round. But I reckon he putted. He must have sunk five miles worth of putts mm. Mm. during the four days. Um, wonderful touch on the greens. And um, and he's uh, Australian champion. We haven't had a British Open champion for nearly 30 years. So mm. wonderful achievement. Yeah. I hope Greg Norman doesn't pull him over to that rebel tournament what do you think about all that it's a bit weird eh? And my head doesn't go there reminds me of old super league days yeah we'll do a podcast on the super league days one day oh. i'll tell you the hidden stories will we what i've <laughs> been trying to get that out here for years they can't make a movie until everyone dies yeah a lot of money they're throwing around for these rebel golfers don't know what don't know what they get back for their their investment um all right let, let's talk um a little bit of coaching. Now, again, I know you spoke about this on Monday, but I wanted to, to pick the the eyeballs out of what you said around the Benji-Tim Sheens thing, and he was pretty forthright that he knows uh, Benji Marshall, who's going to take over as head coach of the West Tigers without ever having coached a game in a couple of years. He says it's a, it's a challenge for him, but he thinks he's up for it. It's not unprecedented. Think about the AFL. Nathan Buckley did that, and he was he was at Collingwood for a long time. It didn't work out for him in the end, but he did have a long reign there. And there is a template there with the Origin coaches too. And Billy Slade has proven this year, albeit in a different environment to a club setup, that you can succeed. Uh, but is this the new model? Because you've been saying for a while, where are we going to get the coaches from? There's been a lot of negative publicity or negative comment directed towards the West Tigers. Are they breaking the mould here? Are we are we going to see players come out of playing and go into coaching, if not immediately, maybe with a year or two's assistant coach experience and then straight into first grade? Is that how we're going to start finding the coaches? Yeah, it's an interesting topic. Um, when you say it's uh, it's new ground, it's not really. Um, and I'll go back and with my own experience here. I mean, I retired from coaching in 1999. In 2000 and 
Uh, one, I was asked to come back and coach the Roosters for 2002, which I didn't want to do. I just started a media career and I wasn't ready to come back and coach. And So they got me back as a coaching director to virtually oversee a program and bring in some young coaches. And so what our system at the Roosters was that I was a director of coaching and then we had we recruited a young Ricky Stewart mm-hmm. to start his first grade coaching career. Um, he had assistant coaches John Cartwright, Dean Pay, Shane Flanagan, and Ivan Cleary. Uh, we encouraged Ivan Cleary to come across and start a coaching career in 2003. And it was kind of like me working with all the five of those coaches who'd never coached, obviously, at the highest level any previously, at the NRL level. Uh, some had had so a little bit of lower grade coaching, um, but as a group we coached all three grades uh, at the club, and we went to three NRL grand finals in a row. And in the third year we went to the grand final in all three grades. We won the under twenties competition, we won the reserve grade competition, and we were beaten by three points in the first grade competition. It would have been one of the most extraordinary years, and that was a a coaching system that that I really enjoyed. And out of that, all of those men went on to coach first grade at some stage in their careers. Um, um, so it's it's a model that helped not only the club at the time, uh, I think clubs you know, are learning now that they need more than just a head coach and, a, and an assistant. That you, need, you need individual coaching for so many of your players and particularly in development, uh, bringing younger fellas through. And um, the roles in, in the game today are much different uh, than what they were 10 years ago and 20 years ago and the more individual coaching you can get the better and that's where these people get their experience I'm I'm kind of all for what the Tigers have decided to do it wasn't their first choice obviously mm. but bringing Tim Sheens in to take responsibility for the results for the first couple of years so that does not impact on a young coach or a rookie coach having to come in into a difficult situation where a club is is going through a transition period or trying to develop or trying to get its rosters right and its development programs right is not such is not such a, a a bad thing in fact it's a good thing and it'll it'll help him work out over the next couple of years whether it's a Benji Marshall or a Robbie Farrell or what have you that the progress is on obviously they've made the commitment to Benji Marshall and Tim would have seen something in him to to make that call but um, you know I think it will help the club enormously it will give them some stability uh, it will give those young coaches some time and some direction to understand themselves as coaching and what actually is involved in it. I think that's what hits them in the face a lot. Even fellas that go from being assistant coaches into a head coach role. Um, and I've spoken to a lot of coaches over the years, normally at the back end when they're, they're facing the sack or things haven't gone so good and and sort of revising how it's all gone for them. And it's not it's not the football and it's not the coaching that beats them. They all know the game and they all know how to coach. It's everything that goes with it. And if your club's not set up right, if there aren't, if you aren't taking um, a lot of the heat for the coach in a lot of other areas throughout the business and, and everything else that goes with it, you know, you, you, your boards, your, your fan base, your members, your sponsors, your corporates, your um, media, your social media, everything else, your salary cap management, your deve- development, your development of staff. There's a whole range of things that the club needs to um, to look after that can't just be left to the hands of the head coach. And it's too mm. distracting and it's uh, and you've got to learn to deal with it. I, I, I agree. I, th- I think we've kind of lost our way in the development of, of coaches and mainly because a lot of the ex-players come straight out and they think coaching is to be an assistant coach of the NRL, <clears throat> where I'd much prefer them to go back and coach you know, an A-grade team or under-16s team or under-18s team, under-20s team and spend a few years underneath, you know, dealing with players, dealing with player agents, dealing with, um, you know, personalities and, and all the other things that go around coaching. It's not just the X's and O's on a, on a board about your attack and defence. They all know that. Mm. It's not that they can't coach or they don't know the game. They do. They all know the game. But it's the other stuff that they deal with or that they're enamoured with if the club isn't set up properly. And, and you know, in any in any time since then, since I go, okay, all I've tried to do is help set up clubs where the coach can coach. He's got all the support and all the, all the facilities and all the uh, equipment and all the technology that he needs, but he's also got 
you know, a, a loyal group of assistants and high performance people and medical people and recruitment people that are working uh, in the best interest of the club. You need best practice in coaching. You need best practice in high performance and physical development. You need best practice in uh, in medical and physiotherapy. You need best practice in recruitment. And you need best practice in development of younger players and bringing through the next generation. And if you leave all that to the head coach, that's that's not that should not be his role, yeah. in my opinion. In so, my opinion. So I suppose... The original crux of what I was getting to was like, can you see? Uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Can you see? Like, and I don't know if he's got an interest. Could 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 Daly Cherry Evans retire in two years, become an assistant to Dares for two years at Manly, and become their coach? Like, is this is this something that might might this be a new model? Might might well, might well, Nathan Cleary finish it? It's, well, not, sorry, a, it's not a new model. Well, I've just explained. Well, that. no, I understand. Yeah. But I guess what I'm saying is, well, we see more of this. I like, think I think we have it's... we have to see more of this. We have to see more of this. But there's another state. I think they should have to coach lower grade teams. I think they should have to coach younger teams and get and get a feel for what it's like to prepare training sessions, to prepare video sessions, to educate kids, to find out how players learn. Not every player learns the same way. You know, just by telling them something doesn't mean they've comprehended it or learned it. Just by showing them on video, they all learn in different ways. Some need to see others do it. Some need to be do it themselves. Some need to have repetition. Some need to watch it on video. Some you can do it over the phone. You know, they they all learn differently, and it's it's getting the nuances of each player and then how that comes together in a in a group situation and working out that positions are different and workspaces are different and personalities are different, characters are different. There's attack and there's defence and there's transitions and there's you know there's all sorts of elements to the game that you've got to, got to look after these days and, um, and you need other people to do it. You can't do it all yourself. You need to be able to delegate. You need to have a, a, a trusted team of assistants that can, that can help you to get to everybody every week um, about their preparation and their development as footballers. And, you know, before they get to that point where they come in and they're an assistant coach to the NRL, I think they should have to coach. I think they should go back and coach for their own development. Now, that might take a bit of time and the money mightn't be as good, but, you know, that's that that should be the pathway that you come through. And, and you know, if any any t- development of coaches that I've ever done, that's what I've tried to do for them, and I think they've, they've benefited from that. But um, the model, the model so far as having that senior person, you know, like Tim Sheens, it's not necessarily that Tim Sheens will be doing the coaching. Tim Sheens will be the director of coaching at the Tigers, and he'll be, you know, a lot of the legwork and the delegating will be to these other fellows who, um, you know, haven't coached before and haven't worked full time jobs before, other than their playing career, um, and, and getting used to that and to the grind of it and understanding how much work there is involved with it. I'm not critical at all of what they've done. You know, they've probably this this wasn't their first choice. No, no. Obviously, they went after another coach, but but they've, they've thought but about they've, what they can they've do. They've thought about it and said, okay, well, let's take our time with this. Um, and you know, getting West Tigers out of where they are at the moment, getting teams out of the cellar and up to the where they can regularly finals competitive, it takes years to do it mm. to set the system up and then to make it sustainable. You just don't want to get there once for a year and then drop away again or. You know, every time you, every now and then you'll drag a couple of good players that'll sort of get you there and win you some games. But you've got to have a procession of that coming through. You've got to have development of that coming through, and that's how you manage your salary cap by having good young talent prepared for the NRL that can come in at any time, and uh, and that's where you get your value out of them in their early years. And mm. you can drop some senior players off at the back end. I suppose uh, a bit of its pulling power too in terms of recruitment, isn't it? Like a player would well, be thinking, well, oh, Tim Shane's is there, and then Benji takes over. That interests me. I'm. I'm keen to give it a crack, whereas they've struggled to land anyone. Right? As I say, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm for a system like this. I like the system that they've implemented in, in that respect, particularly for how to deal with the current, which Tim Sheens is vastly experienced. He's got his reputation. He's a coach. His reputation will never be tarnished. He's won premierships. He's done all that. Everyone understands what's going on here. This is not about judging Tim Sheens as a coach today, as compared with other eras. It's about Tim Sheens taking on a role to help develop the next wave of coaches at the West Tigers and bring some young fellas through the system. Yep. They've got some good young kids there and, and they've got to be developed the right way. And I think that Tim just and the club just saw, well, you know, we really, when they stopped to think about it, this was a good system for it. 
Um, and I hope in two or three years' time, people will see that. I hope it's a success for them. I hope Benji ends up with success and appreciates his time here. But I can remember back when I did a similar thing at the Roosters as the director of coaching, not that I was... Timmy's called himself the head coach, but um, but it was it was a great system. It was a great system for those for those young coaches too, who all went on to, to coach first grade in their own right, mm. and are very good coaches in their own right. Yeah, um, what it's occurred to me doing this podcast this year that a lot of people that would listen to us would have no idea that Tim Sheens used to play like things like that. And we're going to talk about something later that our players yeah. today wouldn't know that Tim Sheens. So, did you play, play with Tim Sheens? I played. With, I played with Tim. Yeah, he was a front rower, wasn't he? He was. What sort of a what sort of a front row was Tim Sheen's? Uh, busy front row. Had a bit of speed, Timmy. Yeah. yeah. Had a bit of speed. Skillful. Yeah, he had a pass in him. Yeah. Had a pass in him. Yeah, it was a pretty tough and violent era back then. Yeah. Um, Timmy went there. I think Timmy arrived there some years before me. He's eight years older than me. Yeah, keep saying that. Yeah, but I played. Um, <laughs> I played. I played with Timmy, and then obviously coached against him for a number of years, and then. I played against teams that he coached. He started oh. with the Panthers in 1984. Took them to their first ever final series. Did he coach you? No. 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 So yeah, that's a lot, not, lot, lot of people listening wouldn't even realise Tim Sheen's decorated career. He's coached the second most first grade games ever. Yeah, he's been around a long time. And they, you and he had a great deal in the early 90s with Canberra and, and Penrith. Um, there's no correct answer to this next question, but so Wayne Bennett stayed at Brisbane for 20 odd years. Yep. Warren Ryan and Jack Gibson stayed for three or four tops, didn't they? And yep. they moved on. How long's too long for a coach? Oh, it depends. Brad Jack, Arthur's been... Jack, Jack always had the theory that after three years, um, um, he, he'd had his impact and it was time to move on. And he coached in a lot of clubs in a lot of short stints. Mm. Um the Parramatta, when he went to Parramatta in 81, he coached 81, 82, 83. They won three premierships and he left. <laughs> My job here is done. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know... Did he, he pick the club strategically that he go to? Like that they were ready to win? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. But he was... T- t- Jack was an innovator. Jack, Jack, um, Jack brought prominence to coaching. I, I would have to say that, you know... You're going back into my early years and maybe older timers and me will, will think differently. But Jack gave coaching its profile. Mm. Coaches didn't really have a great profile up until then. Mm. And we had a lot of captain coaches in the game. You know, going back in, in the mm. early days, they had captain coaches. Jack was a player himself. I think he played for New South Wales and played first grade football. Hard uh, man, wasn't he, as a player? Yeah, hard well, man. Hard man on generally. And, on and off the field. Go and read his book. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Jack came in, and Jack was one of those coaches that uh, went across to the NFL and came yeah. back, and he was one of the first to use statistics and tackle counts. And, um, you know, he, he, he players, there was no favouritism, and there was just, you know, my way or the highway, and um, and he got great results. Uh, other coaches, you know, three, five, ten seen coaches and Craig Bellamy how long has he been there 20 years started in 2002 Wayne Bennett did a long long stint there Trent Robinson's now what yeah. nearly a decade yeah. Brad Arthur's a decade yeah, yeah. Uh, Brian Smith had short stints at a, a number of clubs um, um, I had five years at Penrith I had five years at the Roosters were, were my longest stints mm. um, and gave it away I always thought I'd go back to it but never did and um, Not but I, I think I think I think um, where we're getting to now is that coaches need at least decade-long coaches. I think I think your whole system and your whole thing needs coaches that have longevity around, right. around a system where... When I first went to America in 1992 or three, um, I went across with the Panthers, Roger Cowan and Don Feldes were the CEO and the chairman and... Um, went across to and was one of the things that I looked at and was most interested in was uh, not so much high performance and and coaching but uh, the system of coaching that they had and over there the man named as the head coach actually did less coaching than anyone he had a team of coaches and 
He'd have his you know, offensive or his attacking coaches. He'd have his defensive coaches. He'd have special teams coaches. And mm. They had whole recruitment departments. They had, because they, they worked on a draft, they would have to know every kid in the, in the country before they selected them. And they had a collegiate system that, that prepared their players, which was completely different to the model we have over here. It was, it was a very enlightening trip, but it was what I saw was the future of coaching where we're going here. And I, I went straight back to Penrith and we... We implemented positional coaches, and I had a little bit of that at the, the Roosters. I didn't have assistant coaches, per se. We didn't have a high-performance team. I had, really, it was myself and a trainer, and that's how most coaches operated. We did the lot. But I would try to bring in ex-players or people that I knew that would come in on a voluntary basis and help with a winger or help with a fullback or help with a halfback, help with a front row, help with a hooker, and do a little bit more individual coaching that way. And... Eventually, that's the systems that I think are now getting more and more in place. And um, you need more assistant coaches than we currently have at the moment. That's just mm, mm. if you want to be mm. best practice, if you want to be a, ahead of the rest, that's that's what you need to do. I think probably Melbourne Storm and Roosters and Panthers now have sort of set the standards in those regards and everyone's playing catch up at the moment in, in how to get there. Yeah. The reason for my question is that Brad Arthur's been at Parramatta a decade now. Now, people need to remember, and the Parramatta fans are long-suffering, have won a comp since 86. Um, and a lot of them, are crit- they're very critical on that basis. But the, they were a basket case when Brad Arthur came into the draw. They, they won a couple of wooden spoons. They were going terrible. So now, they're, now they are a regular presence in the finals. Um, well, you'd, you'd, you'd call his tenure a success. Yeah. In, the, in, in by modern day standards, his tenure is a success. You don't, you can't measure everything just by who wins the premiership. There's not one winner and fifteen losers at the end of the season in a competition. You know, people succeed in varying degrees, and you know what some people see as a successful season is is not necessarily the criteria that you would use internally in your club. Mm. Uh, Brad Arthur has been a success at Parramatta. Mm. There is. And if you remember, I think in his early stage when they took over, they had all that salary cap drama as well. And yeah. the club was torn apart and they lost players and had to regenerate. And yeah, they haven't won a premiership since 1986, but that's not Brad Arthur's fault. No, of course it's not. But, the, but, but they are now, you know, the, I suppose the club's move from rebuilding to being in a premiership window and they're losing a lot of players at the end of this year. Like this might be their last throw at the stumps for a little while. If he can't get them there, is he the man to take them to the next step? That's what the agitation is amongst the Parramatta fans. After a decade, uh, it, where is he at? I guess that comes from, you know, fans take their lead from media comment, from, you know, analysis in the media, and, you know, that's generally where the talk is. I mean, how many coaches have we lost this year? And we've, we've still got three or four more in the sites. You know, this coach is under pressure, that coach is under pressure. As soon as it doesn't measure up to where the media thought they should be during the course of the season, they... They ignore injuries, they ignore suspensions, they ignore other mitigating circumstances. Yeah, but this isn't just media talk, Gus. I mean, he is, he's built a team that is capable of winning a comp. The last two years, they haven't won the comp. This in is probably your, his last chance. In your opinion. What, wouldn't you agree with that? In your opinion, but they haven't been good enough to win the comp. But, but, but doesn't that come back on the coach? Well, what's, but what's the failure there? The fact that they didn't win a premiership, that's not a failure. Have you a look at the sides he was playing against? Why does it have? Why does success have to be measured on whether or not he has the gold medal? Did we you mean, not you mean to tell me? You, you mean to tell me at the Olympics, the black with the silver, the bronze medal, the bloke who finished, you know, a half a meter away from the world champion is not a success? No, not at all. But we, what, we only remember the winner. Do we, we only worry about the, the gold of the medal year and look at the teams and say that this param- this is their big chance? Paramount didn't said say that. that. We did. We did. Sa- we did. We did the season. But that's preview. our job. We comment, but we don't know. Well, you know more than anyone who no, what team's no. capable of winning a comp. I told you, there's one team capable of winning this comp. That's where we are at the moment. Right? I, I don't. I don't see not winning comps as a failure for a coach or a club. The frustration for a club like Parramatta, who went through a golden era in the '80s, is that they haven't won anything since 1986. But they have been in position to win a few since then. The fact that they haven't won them doesn't necessarily mean that those eras failed. Oh, I'm not suggesting that. I'm simply asking now, like, is this... When do they get to a point where they have to reset again? 
Like they're losing you're properly. All, you're, you're always resetting. You're always regenerating. You are always bringing new players in. That's what your system should be. Now, if they don't have a system where players are readily available to take the place of others who have either now commanding too much money or they're getting past their, their use-by date or they're getting past their effectiveness or they don't complement other players within the team, you know, to get to that holy grail that you're talking about, well, then, you know, the system in the club is wrong. But... Why can't Brad Arthur coach them for 30 years? What's wrong with the last decade? Is it is it his fault that they haven't won a premiership? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. The question is, if Brad Arthur was coaching the Melbourne Storm or the Penrith Panthers or the Roosters, would their results have been different? If Trent Robinson was coaching Parramatta or Craig Bellamy was coaching Parramatta, do you think the results would have been different? Well, do you? No. You don't think Bellamy or Robinson would have won a comp? The players. No. I do. No, not with the players. No, they had the. No, I don't think so. I don't think they've failed on coaching. In my opinion, some clubs have failed on coaching. Some systems have failed. Mm-hmm. Clubs have failed, and we've got this wide gap in the competition at the moment because of that. But no, where have Parramatta failed then? I don't think they've failed. I've just got through saying that. No, but you said it's not a failure of coaching. Like what? You, are you are you saying they just haven't had the team to win a comp? Well, that, obviously, not, put it down obviously not as good as the other teams they're playing against yeah, or true. whatever happened on the day. I mean, you know, they could have bounced to the ball. I mean, crikey, last year, they, yeah. were, they were beaten two points by the Panthers. Their, their, their dummy half didn't play Reed Marnie. Yeah, that's right. They were beaten on an innocuous penalty before half time. If anyone knew that that penalty was going to decide the match, they would never have given the penalty. If, that, <laughs> if, <laughs> if he clocked him on the chin like that in the last minute of the play, no way he'd have given the penalty. But no one knew before half time that was going to be the winning score. Yeah, that's and that's the way it ended up. What was it, eight six or something? Right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, they could have easily gone on to win last year, but the bounce of the ball on the day, they just didn't have their, their time. There are plenty of teams that could have won a comp but didn't. You know, and sometimes we get very competitive. You know, we've got half a dozen chances to win a comp, but then we get competition where there's only one or two chances, and that's probably where our comp's been for a little while now. And as I say, like COVID didn't cause us problems. COVID Expose the problems in our mm. systems. Okay. That was good. Felt like a stoush and got one. Um, just on just on grand finals and premierships, and um, we'll go through the, the round coming up shortly, we might have a grand final preview this weekend. Panther Shark. Can you say that? Could you say that? That's one possibility. Um, I you, see- you got, you got, you've got... Panthers, who who win this comp, and then you've got Cowboys, Sharks, Broncos, and the new kids on the block. They're the ones that are making their challenge. And then you've got the Roosters and the Melbourne Storm who've been there for years and have probably just come off a little bit. Nothing to say that when finals time comes around, their experience doesn't get over the top of the others, and they're, they're the ones that challenge Panthers. Uh, and then you've got Parramatta. And South. No, I don't see South as a premiership team. You don't? No. You couldn't see them going on a big run with no. Luttrell f- no. carrying them through? No. No? No. No. As good as, as good as they are and as good as he is, they haven't got the defence and Adam Reynolds is still a big loss to that side. Mm. Uh, they're, they're not winning a premiership this year. Parramatta have proven they've got the game to win a big game. I mean, they beat Penrith at Penrith. They're the only side to beat Penrith. They beat Melbourne in Melbourne. They've got that on their day. Their problem's going to be getting there, Mm. being consistent enough to get there. It was, you know, not so much this time last year, but in about three or four weeks from the finals last year, they suddenly went to another level. Whether they're capable of not, they should be. They've They've got really good players there, but... Yeah, you know, I still don't think I still don't think they can beat Penrith on the big day. Mm. But you know, sharks sharks are, are improving. This this could be a precursor to a new run for the sharks. Mm. Uh, you know, they brought Nico Hines and Fanukan in, and some of the young players are really uh, measuring up. Sifa Talakai has mm. has been a, a, a sensation for them. Matty Moylan, hard so new Matty Moylan. Co- yeah, contract you. He's, he's come good. <laughs> he's, he's just signed one. <laughs> you reckon he might go ordinary this week? No, no. He's, He's, he's been good. good. But he's had a terrible run with injury, mm. but he's always been a talented player and he's earned himself a new contract. And they've got a hard working pack and they've got they've got a number of kids there that have come through the system at Cronulla. They've had a, they've had a good development system for a number of years. They weren't yeah. you know, they didn't sort of poke their way through to the top till recent times. And I think Craig Fitzgibbons, a fresh new coach, fresh set of eyes and brought some new systems there and um their performances have, have been great. Um I can't wait for that game. Five thirty on Saturday. 
I'm actually doing it for the radio, and it'll be fantastic. And that'll be pumping. Sharks and Panthers? Yeah, yeah. It'll be pumping out there because they'll go to the footy and they'll hopefully watch a Penrith win, although I can see a try in it either way, and then they'll head over Did to the Penrith take club. all their players? They're all in, all of them. Hmm. I reckon it'll be tight, don't you? No. <laughs> uh, speaking of people that can't take a trick, poor old Pappy. Oh, before, and, and on the Cronulla thing, I know he's a winger, but they'll, they'll miss Sione Katoa. He's gone for the season too. Yeah. Had a couple and, of and, bad that, and that's going to play its part. Look, and and that's probably the only thing that'll beat the team leading the competition either. Mm. You know, if a couple of key members went down, and it, it certainly brings you back to the field. But I was talking on 100 percent footy the other night about the storm, and you know they were saying, "Oh, the storm could do this." They won't. You know, the, you, they're not robots. They can't do it all. That they've had a wonderful era. They've got a wonderful coach, tremendous club. Their performances have been consistently, you know, the excellence. They've been the most reviewed the most studied the most copied team i think in history mm. junior rep coaches and everyone are always looking at the melbourne storm melbourne storm has been held up as the uh, as, as the you know benchmark in so many different areas and trying to get to that level and they were assisted because they had big budgets and um, they were media owned for a long period of time there but now private ownership is you know they still hold their their very high standards the panthers with the development of the academy out there and the system out there and the players that they've produced has has taken the game to a new level at that at that side. Everyone now is trying to play catch up and and everyone wants that sort of model. Everyone's now going for their centres of excellence and you know presenting themselves to potential players and to the public and to corporates and members as a, as a highly professional organisation. That's great for our game. That's wonderful. It's it's how our game will be perceived <coughs> by so many people. So they're really really important. But you know the Melbourne Storm. They get, they, you're always going to have one of these years where you get a few injuries, things don't quite go right, and opposition have now they've probably lost their sense of invincibility, and um, uh, you know, and, and they've got to regenerate again, which they have done uh, plenty of times before. But uh, right at the moment, they're off the pace. So you don't you think they're gone this year? I can't see them winning the premiership. No. Mm. And of course, they're going to lose the two Bromwich boys, Felice Cafusi, next year. Yeah, it's a new time for them. That's yep. where this will test where their development systems have been and what are the, they've been preparing for this time, you know, and what's what's new coming through the system. And, um, you know, they've been able to go out and buy journeymen, and we've all marvelled at the way they've turned players journeymen with, with some clubs that were sort of uh, never really making a name for themselves and go to the Melbourne. But they play with champions, you know, they're playing with champion players and they'd really rise to the occasion and that's but that's not a recruitment system mm. that's 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 not a development system you've got to have younger kids coming through and they've always had ones you know and they've always been other developed players and harry grant and brandon smith and you know a munster and and these sort of fellows have all sort of emerged over a period of time and they're looking for their next wave and they've had a good relationship with new zealand haven't they they do a lot of work over there like well you've got to you've got to go to all corners of the globe Recruitment and development is everything. It's where you should be spending the major part of your, of your club. That's your investment in your future. You can't just turn around and hope to buy Matt Thompson from the other club because you need a front rower. Or oh, you. he's on contract at nine, going nowhere. Is that right? Well, actually, that's not right. Uh, but I'm going nowhere. What position <coughs> would you play if I picked you? Ball playing lock. Ball playing lock. Yeah. How many minutes you got in you? One. It's not going to cut it, mate. Impact player. I'd have been. I'd have been good back in the days of unlimited interchange. If you can do it for one minute, you've got to do it for eighty minutes. They're the rules. Um, all right, that's the serious stuff out of the way. So, <clears throat> I saw a photo of you on Twitter. I think it might have been your first grade debut, with your flame red hair, and you're out in the back line. You're going to throw a little ball, and you're wearing number eight. Yeah, that wasn't th- my first grade debut. That was it? That picture was taken two years after my first grade debut. All right. That picture was my third game in the first grade at Cogra Oval. Third first first grade, right. St. George. And that was, no, my third starting game. So, in the old days, we didn't count a debut until you got picked in the starting lineup. That's right, yeah. And when you got picked in the starting lineup, you played the 80 minutes. There was no replacements. There was no other thing. But I'd I'd spent, uh, that was my third year at the Panthers. And um, I actually debuted in first grade in 1976 playing the second half against Balmain Tigers when I was 18. Played fullback. They put me on at half time. I'd already played in under-23s and reserve grade on the same day. <laughs> Wasn't that the game where you had half a beer? I had half a beer. <laughs> I had half a beer in the spa bar. <laughs> I said, is that, is that your beer? I said, no, 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 no. no. 
put my tracksuit on, went and sat on the sideline, and, and they sent me out for the second half. So it was my debut was 1976, but I saw that social media post, and they, but that that picture is a picture from 1978 at Cobra right. Oval against the Dragons. Um, John Jansen, I think, was the man in the background, the St George player in the background. I was wondering if that was. He had a big head, that bloke. Looked yeah, like a giant nice man. Too. Yeah, tough player. So it caught my eye because, one, you look you look superb and fit and skillful. You're wearing number eight, which made me think you weren't a front rower. No, it was a lock forward. Explain to our younger audience why you were wearing number eight. Well, that was the numbering, international numbering. I think the international numbering is the same today, but... One was your fullback, two and five were your wingers, three and four were your centres, six was your five eight, um, uh, your seven was your half back, your eight was your lock forward. Yeah. So you packed in the eight, and then nine and ten were the back rowers. So I wore nine. I wore number ten for a number of years, mm. at Newdown and Canterbury mm. and South and that, and then uh, eleven, twelve, and thirteen were your front rowers. There you the go. Twelve was the hooker. Yeah. Twelve was the hooker. So I asked David Middleton. Yep. about a rundown, Australia adopted the international numbering system in 1989. Mm-hmm. So the international numbering system is as it is now. Yes. But uh, before that, Australia did things their own way with the lock wearing number 8 and the props 11 and 13. In the old days, pre-1960s, numbering was largely ad hoc. Mm. Some clubs numbered 1 to 13, others 13 to 1. Yeah. <laughs> others others uh, handed out numbers at the start of the season, and that's what you wore the whole year. So if I write down a team, and I've done this all my whole life as a coach, I write down a team, I'm writing down teams on paper and looking at different combinations, I start with the front row. Yeah. Some teams, when they pick, and they pick, they start with the fullback, number one. I don't. I start with the front rowers, and then I work my way through the team. It's just you? how you do it. But the numbering system changed. Uh, when did he say it changed? 1989? 89. Yeah. Changed to what it is now. Yeah, so... Um, that's why Arthur Beetson wore 11 in the first Origin game. Yeah, he was a front rower. That's right. Front rower. That's right. He wasn't a, he wasn't a back... Well, he, he did play back row in his younger days, but he was a front rower. And what would happen is, uh, in the old days, we had all three grades. Mm. First grade, second grade, third grade. Yep. Not an under-20s team. Yep. First grade, second grade, third grade. They, they might have even had fourth and fifth grade back in the day. I don't know. And you would number your club, right, 1 to 39. Yeah. Right? So your first grade fullback was number one. Your reserve grade fullback started 14. with 14. So your reserve grade was 14, 15, 16, yeah, 17, and all the I way to that. 26. Yeah. And then your third they grade was 27. All they the were way, the best days. All the way to 3 to 39. And then you bet your, your, your reserve your graders 40 could, go, something. could go down to number 45 or 56. Yeah. You know, They were the days. They were the days. But you needed your program. You needed your big league You're program correct. to know who this was. So if they threw Matt Thompson on in the first grade in number 44, you go, who's, who's that this big dribbler? Fly? Who's this bloke? And they're looking up and they go back through the grade. Yeah, yeah. It's Matt Thompson. He's Matt Thompson. 45. Yeah. I don't know what number I wore that day. I think... Uh, what day? The day of the The day that I debuted. Oh, right. The day that I debuted. I wonder if David could I find I probably it. was still wearing my under-23s jersey. You could have been anything. <laughs> Which would have been... been it could have been any number. It would have been number 27. Isn't that great? I yeah. love that stuff. So you had your number for the year. Some people think everyone should have their own personal number. You know, in American sports, they've all got their own number. Or well, Super League did becomes that. a merchandise item mm. and that sort of But you don't know where they are and what mm. they're playing. And with our game too, where it is now, with, you know, our all our backs packing the scrum and, you know, the wingers feeding the ball in the scrum and the, oh, no. the, the, the front rowers standing at 5'8". Like, we don't... Our, our numbering system was around your position in your team. Your, your fullback... You had your fullback and your halfback. That's why people were called three quarters, right? So you got your halfback and your fullback, and this was three quarterbacks, half, full, three quarters. So your wingers. Oh, I like it, don't you? All right, that's why they called you the three, three quarters. Three quarter line. The three quarters. The lock locked the scrum. Yeah. So when the scrum come together, he locked it. He bound the yeah. the two second rowers there. The two second rowers and the front row was the front row of your scrum, and that's so now those positions mean nothing. Numbers mean nothing in our game anymore, yeah. positionally at different times and. Um, we don't even refer to people as five eights and centres, and it's just where they defend in the mm. line. It's all, yeah. But so if you watch old, if you're a younger person listening to us, and you watch some of the old Origin games, you might yeah. see, you might see Benny Elias or um, I don't know, Greg Kanesky or someone wearing twelve. Yeah, that's the hooker. Oh, the hooker. Yeah, let me yeah. think. What the yeah. bloody hell is he wearing number twelve for? Yeah. That's why. Absolutely. Mm. He was a hooker. Mm. Ian Walsh and all them great hookers. Freddie Jones, George Piggins. Mm. All wearing number 12. So people think they're a second row, but they're a dummy half off. That's right. Well, even, even back then, you know, back in the old days, your hooker didn't go to dummy half all the time. It was just the nearest bloke. 
Is that right? So he's more like a running player. Well, we, we, well no, you just filled in. But what do the hooker do? He, he just when you kick off, get there. when you kick off in the old days, you say to the boat, "Which way are you kicking, mate? I'm kicking that way. Forwards to the left, backs to the right." <laughs> really? Truly? Why? Because that's just how it was. <laughs> That's just how it was. Forwards there, backs over there. Isn't it Forwards great? take the ball one way, backs get lined out. You'd have half, five, eight, centre, centre, centre full back chiming into the yeah. back line with, <laughs> your, great? with your winger. Oh, it's See, look at all the commentary things we don't have anymore. Full chiming back, into the back line. Full back chiming into the back line. Centre three quarter pairing. Inside centre, I outside centre. I hear people talk about centre three quarter pairings these days, or centre pairings these days. They never meet. They never no. shake hands. What they do don't even see other? each other at training. No. They might see each other past the Bundy clock as they arrive for training. It's that They're on opposite sides of the field. They never pass to each other. Hmm. But in the old days, you had your centre combinations hmm. and your fullback who would chime into the back line. So what would a centre combination be like? They'd, they'd pass. They'd have little trick shots together. You'd lined out. So you'd have your scrums. Yeah. So the scrums were always near the sideline. you know, And you'd have your halfback feed the scrum, then your 5'8", and then throw it to your inside centre. Yeah. And sometimes some blokes were inside centres and outside, outside centres. And then your fullback would chime in or you'd throw it to your outside centre and get to your winger. So your centres then, little... forward, then your forwards would have to come around, start hitting it up again, and your backs would all oh, get you go ready back out that way. for the next time. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so forwards to the left, backs to the right. <laughs> and then you'd, you'd get your back line set and you throw it out the back line. The back line standing deep, charging onto the ball. <laughs> fullback chiming into the back line. Oh, all fantastic. these things we've lost. Yeah. Fair and then, you know, coaches got hold of it and changed it all. And yeah, it's all your fault. Defen- all right, um, a trivia system question. And people started to play in lanes, and then numbering meant nothing. Positions mean nothing. Hmm. In England, they called them differently. They called them standoffs. And yeah, they did, yeah. yeah. First five-eighth? Yeah. Or was that a rugby term? Oh, that's a rugby term, I think. Standoff was a, in, hmm. in England. All right, so your, your trivia scrum, question. Scrum, scrum off. Scrum off, yeah. Scrum your your off. trivia question this week is around numbering. Look, he was a dummer. But, yeah, but Hooker, he didn't always go to dummy half. That's right. That's where we were. Because you know, it was too far. If they passed it over there, I'm not going over there to get it. <laughs> so just, he couldn't be bothered. <laughs> couldn't be bothered. <laughs> Tom, get the dummy half. Hey, speaking of that, it wasn't uncommon for, like, a prop to play Hooker, was it? Like, like Mario did that, didn't he? Did Mario? Mario yeah, started some, as a some, Hooker some and then con- went to the front row. Yeah, some converted into the front row. Who else was like that? You just wanted three blokes that like banging heads. You know, yeah. cause, you know, when well, he was your man, Mario. Clash, clash, yeah. clash. You know, that is... So, I mean, what, so what do you, when you used to pack in, the two sets of front rows would literally just smash heads against each other? Yeah, well, you had the loose head and the feed. You know, the loose head was who was going to have closest to the ball and was determined by who'd made the error, where the ball had gone out and all that sort of thing. So so what would happen is it might be your loose head. So what would happen is it would be as the heads joined in, so it would be our front rower, their front rower, our hooker, their hooker. So yeah. our hooker would be closer to the ball. If you had the loose head, it meant that your hooker was actually closer to the ball when it was going to come in the scrum, ah. and the ball had to go fairly in the middle, and the two hookers would strike at it. Having the loose head was considered an advantage because your hooker would be just, you know, he'd be, yeah. and his yeah, other yeah. head would be there. But what would happen is, even though it was their loose head, the hooker used to put his head alongside the front row so their heads were there and dare them to try and bash it open. Oh, and you'd, so what? <laughs> you'd actually try to challenge the loose head in the scrum. So, so one of the other blokes would just try and belt them with their head. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. What a great game! So you'd look up and you know Peter Kelly and Roy Simmons would have their heads together and say to the other hooker, "If you want the loose head, you got to." Must have made a frightful noise. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, yeah. You'd go and ask all the old time front row. That was scrummaging, man. It was scrummaging. That's why they ended up in a blue most half the time, wasn't oh, it? Oh, lots, lots of times. Oh, yeah. what and there was a lot of work. And you had to push in the scrums, and mm. you might have to pack three scrums to get a result, and the yeah. scrum would collapse, and you'd push in the headbutt, and there'd be punches coming in from the second row, and <laughs> no wonder they were tired. Oh. And then you'd throw the ball out the back line. Yeah. Then they come over here and they go out there. Yeah. Oh, that's well, you throw the ball out the back line and the winger would drop it. Well, you think the forwards weren't oh. happy about that. So I never, I never, I've never really given it any thought. So, so the loose head, that's all about this. So the, the the structure of the scrum would change according well, to who made the error. Well, they had the bind, yeah. So depending who made the error, you you feed the scrum. I think the feeding of the scrum loose head territory. and feed. Loose head and feed, or you'd have sometimes you'd have the feed with no loose head. I don't know how. Yeah. I can't remember exactly how it worked, but loose head and feed was your best chance to win a scrum. You still had to put it in the middle. It still had to be a competition. Right. The, the weight of the scrum and the twisting of the scrum and mm. you know pulling down and loose arms in the scrum to get me down lower so I could get in there. And 
Because um, I remember as a second rower, I wouldn't bind with my second rower. I'd actually put my under my arm under the hooker, so he could sit on my arm to get better balance. For when to get his feet closer I can't to the ball. I believe it's the same game. That's scrummaging. That was scrummaging. <laughs> well, now, that. look at what they do now. He's going there, lean there, Black throws it back to the lock forward. Yeah. But there was also a lot of penalties out of it and a lot of time wasting and scrums. They were the days. Uh, and, you know, by the time you'd packed into 30 or 40 scrums during the course of the day and pushed and shoved. And, oh, 40 scrums. You know, it's. Well, you, 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 but they might have get packed three times before you got a result. Wow. Oh, what a what a great game! I don't know if there's any old timers out there that remember anything. Oh I'm well, they'll be about. listening. Don't you worry. Ask us. Hashtag I'll ask go, us I'll on get Instagram. Vis- I'll go and get you some vision of some old scrums. Well, some we've, old scrimmaging. We're a vodcast too, so we'll we'll be overlaying this with all that old stuff. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, the scrums used to collapse in the halfback and the half. <laughs> um, we've gone forever. Six tackle trivia. You know, you need you need to be switched on for this one. What number did John Raper wear on every one of his kangaroo tours? On his every one of his every one every one of his kangaroo tours. Now, well, no, but did John Ray? When I was know, well, you can you can you can hypothesise and do whatever you're going to do in our little ad break. We'll come back with the answer. Mm. What number did John Raper wear in every one of his kangaroo tours? So there was a party of twenty eight. Mm-hmm. David Middleton tells me, mm-hmm. and they'd number backs and forwards mm-hmm. in order. Mm-hmm. So that's a pretty good hint. When I was a kid, I was a, an avid John Raper fan. Yeah. And one of the greatest gifts I ever got off my parents for Christmas was a St. George Dragons red V jersey with the number eight on the back. There you go. Right. So he always wore number eight. He was a lock forward. Later in his career, he, he changed a couple of times. He, the younger in his career, I think he played a little bit of 5'8". Uh, even, but on the kangaroo tours, I'd imagine that was. Um, I don't know whether Australia went for. Went for that number. I, I'm somehow thinking this is a trick question. He may have had to wear thirteen. I don't know. Um, Johnny Raper. Was he captain of kangaroo touring teams? Or the same number on every kangaroo tour he went on. Wow. First player picked, he wasn't number one. No. Okay, so they know if it was a squad of 28 and yep. they named the backs and the forwards separately. Yep. So they probably have, I don't know, 12 backs, 12 forwards. I don't know, I'll say 13, but 12, I don't know. 15. 15, okay. 1 to 14 were the backs, okay. and he was the first forward. First forward, okay. Number 15. Okay. On every kangaroo tour. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's what I mean. You had your number for the tour. Hmm. You had your number for the tour. That's Good. a trick question. I'm not supposed to know that. I thought you might have got that. No, but he wore he wore number eight for the Dragons because that was my favourite possession. Yeah. And when the Dragons used to play, I used to run around the backyard with a little red transistor radio listening to Frank Hyde call the game, kicking the ball around the thing. Oh, that's great. Listening to the game. And the biggest thing was the Man of the Match award. Hmm. Man of the match won a what? What did the Frank Hyde man of the match get? A watch. Seiko watch, yeah. right? Yeah. And I'm thinking a Seiko watch. How good is oh, that? Yeah. I might have told this story. Yeah. It was my dream that one day I would play first grade football, that I would win the Frank Hyde man of the match Seiko watch. Yeah. And in 1983, I played a game at Cogra Oval for the Bulldogs against the Dragons. Yeah. And I had a good day, and Frank Hyde called the game. Oh, you thought you were in there. And his man came out, and he used to call it on a card table yeah, on, the on the sideline. And at full time, he came over to me and grabbed me. He said, Frank Hyde would like to see you at the desk. He I said, really? He said, you're man of the match. And I'm walking all the way over there thinking, Seiko, what? Seiko, what? Seiko, what? How good this is that? 1983. 1983. You're not a young man. <laughs> you're not a young man there. 1983. Well, I was 26. <laughs> so Frank Hyde, and he gets over there and... Sat down with the great legendary Frank Hyde and he asked me a couple of questions about the game and how did I like this and how I like that and I kicked a field goal and he asked me about my field goal and all that. He said, anyway, and he reached down under the table. He said, the man of the Macedonia won our award. It's a Sanyo uh, tape, rec- tape recorder, um, cassette yeah. player or something or other. They give it back and I must have looked disappointed. He leaned <laughs> over and said, Sanko, don't spawn. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh. I, so I took my 
the cassette radio into the dressing room and I sold it for 50 bucks so I could go over to St. George Legs and have a beer. Oh, did you really? <laughs> yeah. Who bought it off you? Do you remember? Players. Gary oh. Allsop, I think. Oh, that's oh. great. <laughs> Seiko don't sponsor us anymore. <laughs> yeah. Seiko, we're available for sponsorship. <laughs> give give Gussie Watch. Well, it's been to win a Seiko. Well, I used to yeah. run around the backyard. And they, they'd interview the player after the game. Like, Seiko, That's fantastic. Seiko Watch. Imagine winning a Seiko Watch. And then I got the man of the match and he gave me a cassette radio. Oh. I can't tell you how disappointed I was. Poor Gussie. Let's, Seiko, if you're listening, if the boss of Seiko is listening to the six <laughs> tackles with Gus, <laughs> Gus wants his watch. <laughs> and we want one that was that was current back in the 80s. Let's talk about the footy. I'm very excited to get to Combank Stadium tomorrow night, Gus. I reckon this is going to be a cracking game. Parramatta versus the Broncos. It is, you know, I know we've spoken a bit about Parramatta. It is not a, it is not a formality they even make the finals this year. Mm-hmm. They're on 11 wins, the chasing pack. Well, Manly's in, in on nine wins, the Roosters and Canberra on eight. Look, they're probably going to get there, but if, if you're talking top four, it's getting... It's getting to must-win stuff. Now, they've got uh, a full-strength team in, and all the Origin blokes are back for for the Broncos. Uh, Billy Walters is out, however, so he's been replaced by Turpin in the starting lineup and Pakes on the bench. Two very good teams. Thursday night footy here on nine from Combank. Para versus Brisbane. Para got a great record against them at, at home. They smashed them up there in that. That first game. Well, they've, they've actually, you know, they've tortured them the last few years, haven't they? They've beaten them by some big scores. Um, just looking through this Brisbane team, and they too have, have won when under strength this year. They're having a terrific season. This is, you know, the test begins now. The origin is over. We make our runs to the final. So your, your Cowboys, your Sharks, and, and Brisbane's uh, um, uh, fighting out for top fours, which, you know, they haven't done for a few years. And, um, you know, we test their medal now, and this is a big one away from home against mm-hmm. the Parramatta Royals. Now, earlier this season, if you're looking at this game, would you just say Parramatta and dismiss it? But now, mm-hmm. not so sure. Um, we've been pretty good with our tipping. This one, I can go either way. I think if Parramatta... I think if Parramatta can see the the seriousness of their situation and have got any hopes of, of closing this premiership window with a win, uh, have got to be able to perform on this stage against this team and get a victory. I'm going to say Parramatta, but without confidence, I have a great deal of respect for what the Broncos are doing at the moment. I'll go Eel. With our sponsors, Blue Bet, and please do gamble responsibly. Parramatta dollar sixty, Brisbane $2.35 to kick off the round here on nine. Early game Friday, Dragons two forty, Manly dollar fifty seven. Um, that match, as I scramble here, is at uh, Jubilee, at Cogra, and uh, no Jake Trebojevic. He has COVID, unfortunately. Yeah, I see that. And if one player gets COVID, there is the risk that someone else might get it in the next twenty four hours as well. Now, we're dealing with a little bit of that at the Bulldogs this week as, uh, ourselves. So. Um, Manly's playing the better football. Jake is a big loss. There has been some publicity this week around the Dragons and um, and how they're travelling and what they're doing. It was a rather meek performance in the second half last week against the Roosters, an mm. understrength Roosters, to concede so many points. And um, everyone's now starting to bring out the records with the, the Dragons that they've conceded more points at this stage of the season than any Dragons team in history. And It's like 80 points in the last two weeks. Yeah, which, you know, I don't know what... what whether that's a sign of anything or what have you, but they need to muscle up here. They are playing at Cogra. I believe they've trained at Cogra this week, so they're obviously taking this very seriously. Um, Manly without Jake Trebojevic worries me a little, but the Dragon defence, I think Manly should be able to pick their way through it. I'll go with Sea Eagle. Okay, Manly to win there. Friday night footy. Up in Newcastle, the Knights versus the Roosters. Luke Keary, Jared Rhea Hargreaves are back. I thought the Knights were um, very disappointing last week, to say the very least, but they do get back home. Uh, but their season is slipping away fast. You have a look at that team on paper for Newcastle, right? Ponga, Lee, Gagai, Milford, Clemmer, Braley, Daniel Safidi, Tyson Frizzell, Lachlan Fitzgibbon, Mitch Barnett, mm. Kurt Mann, Jacob Safidi on the bench. Look, there is no, they should be going better than they are this year. 
Yeah, they haven't all been available at the same time this year. They've had they've had some injuries and different things, and um, I think they yeah. Forty eight. They are forty two twelve last week. Like they had they had that, that pretty was, much I, the same I side. Didn't, I didn't see that coming. I you know I tipped the other team, but I didn't see that coming. Uh, and Roosters, well, they're just a proud club and hanging on for everything they can. They they got the wobbles a little bit early in the first second half the other late in the first half the other day, but. Smashed it out of the park in the second half. And Luke Keery, want to wish Luke Keery and his family all the very best. I just hope things go well this time in. We see no more injuries. Um, they've had some serious injuries this week, but when you look at it, Momorowski and mm. Manu in the centres, and they've still got Suwali and Tupa. They've still got Tedesco. Well, you're talking a little bit representative class there. Keery, Sam Walker was in the Queensland Origin team. You've got international Rhea Hargreaves and... Um, Lloyd's Angus Crichton, Origin player, Nat Butcher, Victor Radley. Uh, oh, I've got a tip, Rooster. Roosters to win. Canberra versus Warriors, 3 p.m. Saturday down in Canberra. What can I, I can tell you that Reese Walsh has gone to the bench, which is a bit of a surprise. Um, there's no Jordan Rapiner, which, which, even though he's a winger, is a big loss for them. Albert Hopawati has been named to start on the wing, but the Raiders, uh, the Raiders. Been good, of course. They've coming off a victory over Melbourne last week, and um, they've butchered a couple of games this year, Gus. At, at, at least, yep. But if you add two more wins onto them, they're comfortably inside the eight. Yeah, um, and they've got a good draw. This is a game they cannot afford to drop, um, and I'd expect them to get it right. Uh, Warriors obviously a view towards the future with having Reese Walsh coming off the bench and, and putting Chabelle. Chanel Harris to beat as a fullback. Uh, trying very hard, the Warriors. Uh, I'm going to go Raider. Yep. Hard to tip the Warriors at the moment. Uh, 1v3, 5.30, Saturday, Blue Bet Stadium. Panthers versus the Sharks. Panthers with all the origin blokes back, and uh, Cronulla have got Sione Katoa out. They've got Connor Tracy named on the wing, but we've got largely two full-strength teams to do battle here. It's going to be a cracking game. Yeah, it's a, it's a test for the Sharks. Um, it's a good one for them, given the draw that they've had and where they've come through. Um, uh, these games now, as we get towards the finals, let's, let's get harder, the opposition gets better, the stakes are higher. Um, the air gets a little bit thinner. And so they get the ultimate test. And it's a good time to play the Panthers to say, well, this is where we are. No one expects us to win. We can just go out there and throw boots and all at them and... Um, and throw our stuff at them and see how it stands up under pressure. And they will get pressure. I just don't know that the Sharks have got the defence to contain this Panthers side and the fact that they wisely rested all their rep players at the end of a, a hard campaign there and, and got them fit and well. Some went home to the bush, others went overseas and mm. had a little bit of a break while their reserve grade beat the Tigers. And uh, they'll come home and the club's in great shape at the moment. And... I expect the Panthers to win and win decisively. Okay. Blue bet, dollar twenty three Panthers, four fifteen the Sharkies. Yeah. Now, 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 now. Saturday night football. South Sydney Rabbitohs hosting the Melbourne Storm. Now on Blue Bet I notice Melbourne are a dollar seventy out to a dollar eighty and South Sydney even money. Mm-hmm. Hard to uh, obviously no Pappenhausen. Mm-hmm. Hard to uh, to dissect this one. Like again, you would have said at the start of the year, um, ticket off in favour of Melbourne. But Meany's at fullback. They've got no George Jennings, no Remus Smith. So Marion Seve stays in the centres. Tyron Wishart's been named to start on the wing, but they've still got that good forward pack and they've still got the halves. But they're not going great. Well, yeah, Melbourne Storm have traditionally been the best team at the competition in closing down the dangers in the opposition. They've been doing it for years and years and years. They've done it in big games. They really only need to close down uh, Cody Walker and Latrell Mitchell. Mind you, that's easier said than done. Latrell Mitchell is just a, such an X factor these days and he looks to have come back in great nick and uh, he's going to be very dangerous. But I, I just don't rate the South Sydney defence at the moment. I just They're leaking points far too easily and... Um, I think Melbourne Storm will have a plan for Cody Walker and Latrell. I don't think they'll get it their own way. And I don't know that the South Sydney defence um, is ready to stand up to Harry Grant and Munster and Jerome Hughes and okay. these fellows well. I, look, I don't think the Storm are going any great shakes. And 
there's a little bit of inexperience you know, getting into their troops. But I just, I think defensively they'll have a plan for, for Mitchell and Cody Walker. And if they can keep South to less than 20, I think Melbourne will score more than that. So I'm okay. going to go Storm. Storm to win. Sunday, uh, Bulldogs to beat the Titans. Although I think you've got a few little issues there in your camp, as a lot of clubs have. There's COVID everywhere at the moment. And four o'clock. Uh, well, three o'clock coverage starts here on nine, but four o'clock kickoff up in Townsville, Queensland Country Mac Stadium. The Cowboys up against the West Tigers, second versus last. I'd imagine we don't need to spend too much time on that. So let's go through who you are tipping this week. Okay, I'm um, tipping Eel. Flip of the coin, Eel Bronco. Yep. Yep. Seagull. Mm-hmm. Rooster. Raider. Panther. Storm. Bulldog. Cowboy. Very good. Thank you, Gus. Thanks, man. Ask Gus. Hashtag Ask Gus on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We didn't get to too many today. In fact, we didn't get to any because we were reminiscing about the good old days. But we will get to a stack of them next week. Enjoy the footy with us at nine across the weekend. And we will... We waffled on a bit today. We did it. But it was good. Okay. I think we needed a waffle. There's been a lot of serious stuff. Uh, chat next week.